I wanted to thank Mark, who is a dear friend of mine. I got to know him actually through his visits to Arizona um, for his children and for himself. So those different visits that he does here, either because his kids are playing baseball and there are different leagues and tournaments that happen throughout the Western states. And in addition to that, he was actually visiting Arizona. I think probably the first time I met him was because he was actually visiting clients, a number of baseball players who was doing the fall league classics here. And uh, being a Jewish individual, a Jewish sports agent, he is definitely unique in the sense of being observant because I think as you'll learn, there are plenty of Jewish agents, but there aren't, I don't know how many there are, if there are any others um, that are actually observant, keeping Shabbat, keeping kosher, which is definitely unique and does not always help you in your job if you think about it, because it restricts the times that you can meet with people, the places where you can take them. So it was uh, for me, the first time I met him, we actually listened to him. He presented here at Chabad of Phoenix and you got to learn a lot more about the challenges, but the reward that comes from it. And also the beauty of, I think it's very inspirational for me, just knowing that you hold fast and God definitely showers blessings and sometimes there's speed bumps. But we have today Mark Kligman, who is an attorney and as well a pro sports baseball agent. And um, we are very fortunate to have you. So please take it away. You can talk about your family, of course, which I know um, he has a beautiful family, three children, a wife who's also great. And I've been fortunate to meet them all. Okay, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, the Chabad of Phoenix, uh, I guess the greater Phoenix Jewish community is uh, very dear to my family. So Levy is right. Um, he actually hired me for my for my first speaking engagement. Um, might be like, I don't know how long ago, maybe a decade ago. Something like getting that. close to that. Um, and then uh, Phoenix is a very big hub for baseball, not just for my pro clients, but also for uh, youth baseball all the way up to high school, uh, mostly because all the spring training complexes are here and they've got a lot of fields in one very close knit area. So um, <clears throat> a lot of the tournaments which have hundreds of teams will use this, uh, this neck of the woods. So um, I was actually lamenting to my wife the other day that I think in retrospect, if I had to move from San Diego again in 2013, I would have come to Phoenix um, for a number of reasons, not, because the uh, community is so amazing, which is probably the biggest factor, but um, for a lot of other things for, for baseball. But uh, Vegas has worked out okay. Um, and uh, so, so, so here we are. Um, so yeah, so I started as a, as a baseball agent. Um, first, I started as a lawyer. Um, I went to college at Johns Hopkins and played some baseball there. And then I went to Tulane Law School in New Orleans and I, I knew I wanted to be a trial attorney. I wanted to be a defense attorney doing criminal law. So I went into the public defender's office straight out of law school. And that was a really fun job um, with some really fantastic lawyers. And I learned a lot. And then I, I, I thought maybe I'd always be a sports agent. I didn't really know too much about it, except for maybe what everybody saw on TV or from reading articles. Um, and then one thing led to another where I was doing some coaching and I had some kids that were becoming pros and I kind of jumped into it. Um, the funny part about the job is that if you ask me, and this has been asked to me before, what would, what would you do differently if you had to do it again? And my answer would be, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do the job. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be a sports agent. Um, there's, well, Levy was alluding to it before, but there's a lot of high risk, high reward. You know, and my, my analogy that I use is that, you know, if you're a waitress or a waiter at the International House of Pancakes, uh, as long as you pretty much show up on time and you don't spill the syrup on, on the, and the coffee on the customers um, you're pro and don't offend your boss, you're probably going to have a job every single day and you're going to have a really steady paycheck. But there's not a lot of reward beyond that in terms of big money and there's not a lot of risk, right? You're going to have a job, but you're really not going to make much more than what you're making. It's the polar opposite for a baseball or any agent for that matter. You're you're, you're really betting on the come to use a Las Vegas gambling term, because when you sign a kid, you might make a few bucks from the, from the draft, from the signing bonus, but unless they're making multiple millions of dollars, it's not really a lot of money. Even if you get a kid who's drafted, like one of the kids I'm going to see today, and he got about 600,000. So if you're taking, you know, 4% or 5%, 
And you can do the math. It's like $24,000. That's not bad, but you know, you certainly can't, it won't, that won't even pay for Jewish education for one year for more than a couple kids. So, um, and then for many years thereafter, when they're in the minor leagues, they're not paying you anything and it could take them anywhere between who knows two and six years, seven years to get to the big leagues. And then once they get to the big leagues, people think, Oh, you've got a major league client, you know, you must be raking it in, but that's not the case either because when they're making the minimums or close to the minimums, we are precluded from taking any, any money that can put them below the minimum because the minimum is something that's been negotiated by the players association, the union, and Major League Baseball to guarantee what the minimum is for a player. And so for us to take it from the, them, well, then that sort of counteracts, number one, the purpose of the minimum. And number two, having an agent should help you get more than the minimum, not below the minimum, but they're precluded from getting above it for various reasons. So so we, we, we can't make any money. So it could take a guy three or more years to get to what they call salary arbitration status where their, their salaries will then really jump and then we get to do an arbitration. And I've done arbitration. I, I, I beat the Miami Marlins in arbitration for one of my clients a few years ago. We won 3.4 million um, versus what the Marlins wanted at 3 million. Um, and then after arbitration, you go to free agency where that's where everybody reads in the newspapers, the multi-million dollar contracts and, and multi-years. And those are great if you can be fortunate enough and blessed enough to get a client to there. And I was, I have, one of my signature clients was Carlos Ruiz, the longtime catcher for the Phillies. And um, he was the one who caught Roy Halladay's perfect game and Roy Halladay's uh, no hitter in the playoffs. He actually has the major league record with Jason Veritek for the most no hitters caught in a career, which is four. And he won the World Series with the Phillies in 2008 and was back in the World Series in 2009. And he was an all star in 2012. So I was able to do a multi year contract for him, which was also pretty amazing. Um, but, um, like I mentioned, you know, people think we're making a lot of money when you have a big leaguer, but after you get a couple bucks from the draft, you're looking at maybe anywhere between likely a minimum of five years to potentially 10 years of sticking by that guy, betting on the come. And what are we betting on? We're betting that he's going to be good enough. We're betting that he's going to be healthy enough. And we're betting that he's going to be loyal enough. And loyalty these days is you could kiss that goodbye. Um, it's, it's a very uh, bad indictment on the human um, sociology. But what I've learned is that for the most part, most people are only as loyal as their options. Um, so like, let's say you're dating, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the backup uh, kicker on the football team and you're in high school. And all of a sudden, the uh, quarterback of the football team shows them interest. Well, you know, the kicker may not look so uh, so cool amongst your friends, and so you might uh, you might become uh, more interested in dating the quarterback from the football team. So that's really kind of what happens. And so, to find a loyal client who can resist the temptations that all the other sharks and all the other agents are putting on them to leave is is a very rare occurrence. And loyalty is. Um, is, is a very wonderful American and human ideal. But when it comes to representing athletes and entertainers, but athletes in, in particular, there's very little um, loyalty that's, that's there. Um, and, and what compounds it is that, um, you know, you might be a real estate agent and you might have a client, you might be an accountant and have a client, a lawyer have a client. And for the most part, not a lot of other people know that there's that client out there. I mean, I guess if your home is for sale, you could have competing agents trying to get their business. And I guess that happens from time to time. But for the most part, you get kind of left alone. If any of you have ever sold or bought a house, I, I don't think you've got, once you've chosen your real estate agent, 20 real estate agents coming and saying, well, I'll do it for 2%. I'll do it for 1.5% or this guy sucks because of this. And you shouldn't sign with him because of this. And that's exactly what happens in my business. And so it can be very um, challenging to try to please the players all the time make sure you don't kind of have any mess ups and you can maintain their loyalty until they're ready to write you a check. And if they leave you right before that moment, you have very little recourse. Um, so it's a really screwy business model. And I think that to go into it, you have to have tough skin. You have to realize, especially as a religious Jew, 
that it all comes from heaven and that the right people are going to be given to me or sent to me. And uh, the ones that uh, are not supposed to be represented by me will eventually fall by the wayside. So being a religious Jew, observant Jew has certainly been helpful in this kind of business. Um, so anyway, that's sort of the nuts and bolts of it. I, I have had some success, like some of the things I've mentioned. I've, I've flown on the private jets. I've gotten into the ball games. I've pretty much done everything in the business you can do. Um, but it is very competitive. And um, uh, it's, it's also not, I can tell you this too, it's also not the most intellectually stimulating. And, and for those of you who enjoy intellectual stimulation, whether it's uh, the Friday crossword puzzle for the New York Times, or uh, just trying to figure something out at your work. Um, it's, it's, it's really the routine is, it's like ordering equipment for guys and begging Nike for a deal and you know uh, begging the Minnesota Twins to give your guy a job. And you know, then w when you get to salary arbitration, that certainly is somewhat intellectual. But again, that doesn't happen so often. It happens once a year and depends how many clients you might have. Um, I do get hired to do salary arbitration preparation for other agents' clients. I have had some success with that. Um, but um, uh, that's also you know, somewhat competitive. Um, and that's definitely more intellectually stimulating, creating PowerPoint um, slides, trying to devise a strategy and things like that. Um, and, and sometimes the chess matches of, of free agency and who's out there and what to do. Um, uh, one second, I gotta send a text. He is working, so we got we got to give him that little. Uh, <laughs> so, so just one second. And while you're sending that text. Okay, uh, I'm done. Um, so Mark, you uh, can change your view to gallery view, so you can see people. Oh yeah, that's fine. Um, and then um, okay, I see everybody. So uh, so really, that's that's kind of like the nuts and bolts of it. Um, I think what you see on television, it's part of it, or when you watch Jerry Maguire but it's really not the day to day. Um, there's spots throughout the year that, that can be inter, inter, um, uh, intellectually stimulating. But, but I think for us, you know, being an attorney and like I've kind of gone back to practicing law where, where my roots were and I, I find it fascinating um, just how intellectually stimulating it is for all the cases that I, I work on on a daily basis. Um, so I think you gotta try to find, I still represent players, obviously I'm here to visit a few, but. Anyway, so that's sort of the introduction of what it's all about and a little bit of experiences for me. So um, I'll be happy to answer um, any questions. Um, I can actually, certainly- Mark, before uh, you take questions, do you want to share a little bit about your um, family? Because I know hmm. that people will be very right. interested to learn about Ellie. Right. So thank God I got a great wife. Thank God I got three kids that are better than me in just about every way. Um, I have a, a son and a daughter, Ellie and Tova. They're twins. Or 18 uh, seniors in high school. And then I have a younger son who's 20 months younger named Ari and he's a junior. So, um, I mean, thank God uh, they're, they're, they're very blessed kids. Um, and um, athletically, they're, they're all very good. Um, Ellie from a very early age showed a lot of uh, unique talent um, in, in many aspects. Um, and uh, Ari is, is, is making his way too. Um, so from the very early stages of things, when they came into this world, they've been observant from birth. And, and before I had children, I, would, I, I, I coached forever and I wouldn't coach on Saturday. And I had the ability to move around the games and stuff, but it wasn't involving my kids. So anyway, long, there's been a long story, but um, I've been able to try to navigate youth baseball and high school baseball and elite travel ball um, with, with having our kids not play on the Sabbath, not playing on Shabbat or playing on the um, holidays. And so we've had a lot of stories that have been interesting that have come from that. Um, uh, and we've had you know, some games that we had to change. We've had some games we had to miss, um, but we've stay, stayed strong about it. And um, thank God, uh, mid-January, um, there was an article that came out on Chabad.org about my older son, Ellie, since he's you know, closest to graduating and is on his way. And he's, he's getting recruited by Division I schools, and he's also been looked at by major league teams. He's on their draft portal, probably had about eight teams so far. He, he made the area code teams last summer, which is a 
sort of the top 180 players in the country who are seniors in high school playing in front of all the major league teams. And um, it's pretty prestigious. So um, he's done a lot of scouting events and he's played in front of a lot of scouting directors and he's a legitimate pro prospect. And um, uh, anyway, so, so he's been doing a lot of speaking kind of like I'm doing now uh, to schools and Jewish groups and communities. There's been uh, podcast done on him on various places. He was on, if anybody's from New York, you remember 1010 Wins News Radio, right? You you give us 22 minutes, we'll give you the world. And uh, Ellie was featured on 1010 Wins on a podcast and they played his uh, clips on the morning drive. And then just um, a couple weeks ago, here was a feature article, a full page in the New York Times on Thursday, a couple, three Thursdays ago, um, about our family and, and him about how he wants to try to be the first division one baseball player, highest level of college um, to not play on the Jewish Sabbath. And we have coaches who are willing to try to make changes for us at the next level. There's never been a Sabbath observant, as far as we can find, Sabbath observant Jewish division one college baseball player in history. And of course, there's never been one at the pro level. So, you know, I don't know, maybe me being an agent was really just a conduit to, to getting to the point where I can have the connections to try to make some of these things happen for, for Ellie, but, um, and hopefully Ari to follow, we'll see, but um, he's got a long sort of road to go, but he's off to a good start. And the amount of feedback we've had from Facebook, um, people emailing me who I don't even know, uh, sending Ellie direct messages on Instagram. And we even have a, a television or a, a television movie producer who wants to potentially follow him around for the next, two to four years and gather up um, film and, and um, uh, to sort of see where everything goes. Um, it's been pretty overwhelming. The Israeli national team called and they want him to practice with uh, them this summer and play. Um, so I think that's one thing I, I helped set up for, uh, for Benita's son when he was, before he got his uh, regular job with the team Israel. So um, it's been a lot of really interesting um a bit of the last two months have been pretty interesting for the family. Ellie still has stuff he's doing, uh, speaking to groups. And it's really humbling that so many Jews and even some non-Jews out there are very inspired by the story that even if, if you go look at the New York Times article, you could just Google New York Times and probably Jewish and it'd probably come up or Ellie Kligman, E-L-I-E. But, you know, it says in there, even if he got a $10 million bonus, he wouldn't play on the Sabbath. And of course now, now we're locked in. I mean, there's no, there's no, there's, there's no going back now uh, to any of that stuff um, once it's been so widely picked up. I mean, the article was in the Jerusalem Post um, in Israel, and it, it's been all over. But it's even coming out in a German newspaper. Um, so isn't that ironic? But um, so, so anyway, we've sort of had multi dimensions of of trying to spread the the, the love. Um, kind of circling back to, to the baseball thing when the baseball winter meetings, which usually happens in the first couple weeks of December um, coincides with Hanukkah. I'm the guy that puts together the Hanukkah menorah lighting uh, with jelly donuts and everything. And so we get reporters and general managers and scouts and other agents. And it's really a wonderful thing to bring everybody together and light the menorah. So somehow, somewhere, somebody made a Wikipedia page about me and on there is you know, featured being sort of the rabbi of the winter meetings and I'll, I'll take that uh, that moniker any day. It's it's very wonderful. Um, so anyway, that's that's sort of what we're doing. We're representing players. We're we're uh, arguing cases. Uh, we're trying to showcase Ellie Kligman to see if he can be the guy uh, at the next level and and be a, an example. And our, our our attitude has always been like, why not? Like, why should we take no for an answer? We love playing baseball. Why can't you be a religious Jew and play baseball also? Right? How hard is it to move a game a couple, three hours here, a couple, three hours there? And we're very grateful for those who, who see it. And I think that for the religious Christians, you know, one of the schools that we're looking at is in the South. And for religious Christians, I mean, how could they look themselves in the mirror if this opportunity came before them? And our coach called up and said, hey, can we play at 3 p.m. instead of 6 p.m.? And, and how could they say no? I mean, they themselves are going to church and putting religion first. So I think the world's ready. I mean, Many of you are maybe a bit older. Uh, the thought of having a uh, gay marriage on the books, <laughs> even a decade ago, or having all the Black Lives Matter or 
a lot of the things that happen now where um, people's uh, individual rights, whether it's being with their race, their religion, their orientations, whatever, or right now put put very, very prominently and nobody wants to discriminate against anybody. No one wants to say no to anybody. So whatever, whether you agree with any of that stuff or don't agree with that, any of that stuff, who cares? Because if we can take all that momentum and use it for a nice religious Jewish boy to go play baseball and still keep the Sabbath and dive in three times a day and a bunch of non-Jews are going to help us out. And why not? We'll take it and run with it. So anyway, that's sort of the, is that what you're thinking of lady about the kids? Yeah, no, thank you. And um, I do want to open this up for questions. So if anyone does have a question, definitely feel free to unmute your mic and ask. Um, maybe address one other thing. Has your observance ever hindered? Um, maybe for clients or that someone has actually dropped you because of it? You know, I don't know if they've dropped me because I don't think they would ever tell me that. They would just make up some excuse. Um, you know, sometimes if you don't want to work with somebody, you don't really just tell them why you just take your business elsewhere. So I don't really know. Um, but I've had a lot of my players who said that they thought it was a positive thing. I can tell you that I travel throughout the state of California in all kinds of small counties with uh, my yarmulke on and nobody, nobody says boo. I haven't had one client that even said anything. And sometimes I work with them for months before they even meet me. So I don't, I, I don't think so. And um, has it hindered me? I mean, it makes travel a lot harder because I can't do it on Shabbos, you know, and I got to really think a lot about food when I mean, you can always go to the supermarket and stuff. But I mean, like today I'm flying to Ontario, California, and I'm probably heading over to Kitchen 18 and grab a bunch of Chinese food and take it with me. And, you know, so it makes it a little bit harder, but um, seeing some games and stuff too makes it harder. But, you know, you can make it work. That's my attitude. My attitude is that you can make anything work. You just have to have the drive and desire to do it. And a lot of my clients, you know, they listen to Ben Shapiro and they're very conservative anyway. So I think they're pretty, so they, they all came to my kids' bar mitzvahs. They had a great time. Um, so so you, I, you actually just touched the topic. I, I'm a sports fan for those of you who haven't figured that out in the last year and change. Um, I think I read an article yesterday or two days ago that said that baseball's moving of the all-star game you don't have to comment on that but this little point that you mentioned baseball's moving of the all-star game out of georgia which was said because it doesn't fit with the uh i'm going to say the political view of the players and there was an article that said 80 percent of the players are actually conservative so they don't really take that is that you just mentioned that a lot of them are conservative listening to those types of podcasts so you've actually seen that yeah i think so the one thing about playing sports, you know, somebody once said to me that the only true part of the, of the newspaper is the sports section. The rest of it's skewed, whether it's just perspective or opinion or someone's got an agenda. But, you know, when the 76ers beat the Knicks, it, it was 86 to 83. And that's, that's the truth. And this guy scored that many points. And so I think that, so I think that when it comes to athletics, the people who participate in it at a high level kind of like have the attitude of, you know, stop complaining, shut up, nobody cares. Like, just do your job, right? Probably the military is a lot like that too, right? Um, I don't want to hear excuses. We need to take the hill, go take the hill, you know? So uh, that, that's a lot of sports, I, I think. I think that sports lives on, a, on the margins of maybe society now and to some degree with respect to that because it's, it's reality, right? You either can do the job or you can't and it's a business and you'll get let go and the next guy coming up will be better than you and You've got to learn how to adapt and adjust and perform. So I think, I think there are a lot of people who are much more conservative and, um, than liberal. Yeah. I think and that's I, and I didn't true. want to go and apologize. I just thought it was an interesting thing that you, you mentioned as a side note. Yeah. Um, Stan or Betty, I don't know who has the question. Um, I have to challenge the sports story. story or question. I should ask story or question. Both. Okay. Um, actually we are in New York and I read the article about your son. Yes, and I thought it was fabulous, okay? I have to tell you that uh, we have uh, our grandson. Our son is a Mets fan, so his name is Shay. Nice. Yes. I like and, that. And so, uh, My comment was I'm glad he wasn't born later. He would have been called City Field. 
or city, right? Yes, right. And um, I think it's remarkable that you can uh, be observant in the, in in a in anything. Do you have a question? Yes. And my question <laughs> is, how does your wife feel about all of this? Well, my wife. Um, uh, uh, well, uh, what do, what do you mean about all of this particularly? I mean, all the notoriety and all this other stuff and. Well, oh, uh, I mean, I think she thinks it's a, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, it's a Kiddush Hashem, and and it's an inspirational story. Um, the thing about Ellie is that he really carries himself the right way. He is a pretty humble kid, but he knows he's good, and he understands he has a job to do. And, and there was maybe a couple years ago, I turned to him and I said, you know, look, we're about to embark on this whole recruiting thing. You know, you're a good player, et cetera. You know, the whole Sabbath thing, we've been doing it our whole lives. But this has got to come from you. You can't just do it because it's what you've always been doing. It's got to be organic. And are you ready for this? Are you ready for the challenge? Are you ready to do what we've always done? And he, he told me 100%. He, he's never wavered. And so he, he carries himself really the right way. And I think that because he does that, and none of the attention seems to get to his head, he really is like, he does the interviews, he'll do the, the podcast, he'll, he'll read the article when we pull it up, and then he goes back to regular being an 18-year-old. He doesn't, like he knows, I think he's such a professional, and maybe that has to do with hanging around a lot of big leaguers his whole life, and he's been around major league players, he's seen how they carry themselves, and he has a perspective that he knows this isn't where he wants to be. This is just a, a point of departure. This is a stopping point, or a not a stopping point, but this is a, it's a, it's a, it's a benchmark. It's a, it's a point by which he needs to pass, but he knows where he needs to go. So I don't, so, so I think because he carries himself so well and it hasn't really negatively impacted him and his personality, I think my wife is, is thinking it's great. Um, she, she's more the pragmatist and everything, but no, she, she thinks it's great. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very humbling. You know, it's not, it's not so much about us and putting us in the spotlight. It's more about like what the story can tell and hopefully it'll inspire somebody. That's, that's really what we want to, to see come out of that. But, it, but, but on a personal level, the fact that it's in the New York Times and it's been picked up so many places gives, I think, I think it's all Hashem's plan, right? So, so now our coach can call up the athletic director or the coach of the other college and say, hey, I got to send you this. Mm-hmm read it. I'll call you in 10 minutes. Okay. I get it. I see what this kid's trying to do. It, be, it gives it legitimacy that it's a story as opposed to being on Chabad.org, which is wonderful in the Jewish community, but you know, the head coach at NC state probably has no idea what the heck that is. But once you see New York times, you know, it's really legit. So I think, I think, I think if Hashem's plan is how I hope it will be, these are steps that are leading to the ultimate goal of, of accomplishing changing games, accomplishing getting Ellie maybe to the next level. Um, so, so yeah. Thank you. I think it um, makes it. I think it makes him authentic. Now he's got to show up. That's what that's what yeah. Mark told me a couple of years ago. I asked you about this. He's got to show up now. Yeah, he's so got to do it. Made it to the New York Times. So, question in the chat: yeah, What is course. Tova's area of interest? So Tova's a swimmer. She's a total go-getter. She's really smart. Um, she got into UCLA and YU, and she's actually there in Los Angeles today um, looking at UCLA, and then they're flying to New York, I think, next week, my wife and her. Um, she's an okay swimmer. She's a good athlete. Um, she wasn't super interested in athletics, but what she's really been doing is um, she volunteers at a hospital. She's a water safety instructor. She's a lifeguard for the city of Vegas. Um, so... Um, She's, she's been very busy with respect to that. And then, do you spell your name Kligman? Yes. And I am related to the dermatologist, Dr. Kligman from Pennsylvania. Yep. Um, I, I think it's our great, my, I think our grandfathers were brothers, our great grandfathers were brothers, and then it goes down, goes down that line. But I have him on my family tree. And then Steve asked, how was the New York Times article arranged? So uh, just about all the, the, the Chabad.article.org article, um, 
that that had some some genesis and people talking about Ellie to the people over there. But almost everything else was everything else was all organic. People came to us. So David Waldstein, the author of the Times article, I didn't know David before. I know a lot of reporters, Jason Stark and, you know, um, um, who else? Um, I know John Heyman very well and um, John Paul Morosi and, um, I, you know, I, I know um, Joel Sherman. So I know a lot of the reporters and, and, and I didn't know him. Then he actually just reached out to me. He read, I think he saw the Jew in the City podcast. Um, which, uh, which was, uh, yeah, it, 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 it is what it is. So he saw the Jew in the City podcast with Ellie, and I, I think he thought it was, oops, thought it was really interesting. So he, um, he reached out to me, and then we started chit chatting. And he worked really hard. They said the New York Times sends their own photographers, which is kind of cool. Um, and uh, he worked really hard. He 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 wasn't familiar with a lot of the observance and the different stuff. And so he really worked hard to get all the stuff right. And I think if you read the New York Times article, it's very Jewish authentic. Like they got the details right. And it's because David worked really hard with me to go back and forth. Like, is it Shabbat? Is it Shabbos? Like, how long does it last? Is it 24 hours? Is it 25 hours? So he got the details right. Nice. Now, if um, if he does do well, you want to tell everyone the process? Because I know you, I've understood from you, there's there's quite a long process uh, really from where he is right now being recruited and then even making it onto the baseball field. For college or pro? Yeah, for college. Or, I mean, college to pro. Uh, well, we're, COVID has presented some problems with trying to figure out his college, but hopefully we'll get that figured out in the next couple of weeks or could be into June. But um uh, once he chooses a, a college, the draft is July 11th. I don't think he's going to get drafted high enough that he would go, but um, he may get some conversation. Um, been kind of transitioning a little to catcher, and I think that that might be his best position, but he also pitches and plays shortstop. So once he goes to college, he's there for three years at least, but usually. And hopefully by the time he's 21 and he's a junior in college, he'll be good enough to to really get some some looks at, at getting so, a chance to play so pro he's going to transition to catcher is he speaking to the director of the braves for some tips <laughs> uh no by the way for those of you who don't know benita sana Bent, who you all know and does our in the kitchen uh with benita her son went through the minor leagues as a catcher right i think that's sort of the position he played and then now currently is the director of operations for the atlanta braves so he's gone up through the ranks of the different uh, front office, and now he's promoted this past summer. Um, it's a great promotion, obviously. And I think Benita's bone to pick with uh, Mark always is he didn't sign him. <laughs> it's okay. We're still friends. Um, any other questions? Yeah, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to um, unmute your mic. And... Um, there's no question that Mark will shy away from. So I don't want you to think that uh, you're you're stepping on him or uh, offending him with a question. Does he know Scott Boris? Is that NBA or baseball? Baseball. Is he good? Uh, I don't know. I know, I'm I'm just... I know who he is. But... <laughs> Benita, did you have anything that he should mention that maybe he missed? Like just Do I have anything? Well, I'll tell you that you know, all roads lead to Chabad, I have to say, because it was when you came in uh, to speak at Chabad, Adam was a freshman at Kansas State. What year was that? It, well, he'll be 29 in two weeks. So he was 17. So it was 10, 11 years ago. He was at Kansas State? He was at Kansas State his freshman year. He played at Kansas State. Mm-hmm. And so that's how far back. And but it was because I had read, and we were completely un, unassociated with Chabad. But I happened to see an article in the Jewish News that you were going to be speaking at Chabad because I have a baseball player. I said, "Yeah, we got to go see him. He's a Jew." And you know, and and the one thing I'll say about the kids, about the players from the high school level, but really specifically college level more than the pro level. Um, you had two kinds of players and then the, the big percentage 
were very conservative Christians and, and very upstanding. You know, you had your fringe element, but um, it, it's really baseball. The athletes are very, very different than any other sport. And so I, I in a sense, I understand the acceptance of a religious Jew within baseball more than anywhere else. But yeah. So we go back a long way. We do. I think that we was do. Like Adam 10 or got 11 married, years, by right? the way. Do you know that Adam got married? No. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. February 1st. Wonderful. Uh -huh. That's so, awesome. <laughs> she's from small town Louisiana. Which so town, now yeah. when you guys uh when you go to Atlanta, you're gonna have to visit Adam. That's so right. Far. Well, he's visited Adam in Atlanta before. Yeah. Yeah. We've, you had kosher lunch with him. Yeah, we I try to find him when I can. Uh-huh. And he'll he, be in um, Chicago with the the team's gonna be in Chicago this weekend. He'll be in Chicago. Nice. Um Mark, you do have a question. What was your break into being a sports agent mm. since you were a lawyer first? Uh my break, um, I, I coached and during my summers of law school in Los Angeles, right by the Rose Bowl. I, I, I uh, coached some summer baseball and I had a couple kids off there that one was a senior at Oklahoma and one was with the Mariners. And I, um, I, uh, I, I, I thought maybe that might be something. And then back in San Diego and I met a kid at the gym who was with the Reds and I thought to myself, all right, so Reds, this guy's the man, maybe three makes an agency. So that was just about when some of the contracts were kicking in in the late nineties. And so I decided to jump into it and kind of open shop in January of 98 and it's been history. Now what I know this, when did you become observant? Was it around then or was it before that? Um, it was, um, uh, observant started kind of at a law school. So, so it was already, so, you're saying it was already something that you knew you were going to be working around certain things when you start taking on these clients. Yeah. Some, some, something we knew that it would, it would be. Um, so yeah. And that I had some trepidation as to how it would all play, but it was also a little bit of a different time. I mean, it was 22 years ago and the world has definitely even changed more than, than it was then, right? Everybody had Seinfeld. Everybody knows what a New York Jew sounds like. So one other question. Why like why is it that you stick to baseball? Is it very different for each sport? Um, I mean it's it, it is different and it's different to try to um get known in the in the business and having name recognition and having some personal relationships with people like in the front office and scouts, just it's immeasurable. So it's you know, in any business you get known and you know it makes it easier. All right. Well, if any, if there are any other questions, please let us know because I do want to make sure Mark can get to his uh, baseball meetings this uh, afternoon. So, if you do have a question, um, please take that opportunity now. Don't be shy. If not, in the meantime, I wanted to say thank you to you, and thank you for your time and good luck yeah. with your uh, continued meetings. And now it's two careers as you've listened to him. He's not only focusing on baseball, and all of a sudden baseball brought him back in, which is pretty. Uh, I guess that's the hand of God that you talked about. Yeah. Yeah. The folks have social media like Twitter or Instagram and you want to follow Ellie or myself, you can do that. Um, they were pretty easy to find on a search and I'm not a big Facebook guy, but uh, I know Levy is, so I'm sure he'll. I got to know my clientele. Yeah. they republish stuff, but uh, <laughs> no, thanks. Thanks for everyone coming to the, I guess it's like a lunch and learn, I guess. I don't know if anyone's eating. Lunch, but... yeah. Lunch yeah. lunch. No, thanks, and keep supporting Chabad of Phoenix. I, it's, a, it's like my second home. I, when when Levy's dad welcomes everybody on Shabbos when we stay here, he does not welcome my family anymore. We are we are no longer considered guests. We are members of the community, which is very heartwarming because it's a great place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Mark.